Well, good morning and welcome again to uh, another streaming service here at Foothills Fellowship. We're glad that you're able to watch us and worship with us this morning as we wait uh, to be able to gather again as the church here in person at Foothills Fellowship. It's obvious to everyone that we live in an anxious time within our culture and within our world. And Proverbs 12.25 says that anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. The Hebrew word translated as anxiety means the emotional distress caused when something vital to your life is threatened, like your health, like your job, your income. The key to dealing with anxiety is to look at our heart attitude toward the thing threatened. There are many things that are considered important for a high quality of life in this culture, and yet, as we have seen, if we rely on God the most, that makes everything else less vital and thus are our lives a lot less fragile. Anxiety cannot be completely eliminated because Paul loved his young churches. He was anxious for them. And yet he counsels us to avoid debilitating anxiety by deliberately resting our hearts in God rather than anything else. In this proverb, however, we are told we should not try to deal with anxiety on our own. We need a kind word from others. And that's why during this time of sheltering at home, we need to be texting, social media, however, to stay in touch and to encourage one another until we can get back physically uh, in, into the church. We need people to affirm us, to relate their own experience, to point us to God, or even just to be there so we don't feel so alone. So what helps you the most when you are anxious? Have you used all the spiritual resources that you have available to combat anxiety like prayer and contemplation and worship? Lord, you have instructed that I deal with anxiety through, among other things, thanksgiving, so I thank you for all the ways in the past that you have taken care of me. And I thank, you that, uh, I thank you ahead of time knowing it will be wise and good for whatever you do with my future. So Father, we uh, humble ourselves corporately, even at a distance, before you, El Shaddai, God Almighty. You are the giver of life. You, the, you are the preserver of our lives. You are the good shepherd. And because that is true, we shall not be in want as we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. Instead of uh, letting anxiety crush our spirits, give us grace to worship you, to be thankful, to encourage one another, to use our time wisely and well during this time of crisis. Keep us healthy, keep us strong, keep us faithful, keep the evil one far from us. Fill us up with your blessed Holy Spirit and bring glory to your name as we worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. Amen. A couple of things before we have our call to worship and get to sing. Uh, one is uh, many of you have been aware of the situation with Antonio Sarlo. Antonio, many years ago, was part of our church family. He is the father of Anthony Sarlo, Greg Sarlo, Mia Sarlo, uh, he came down with the virus and he was uh, in intensive care and he was on a ventilator, ventilator for a period of time. He was in a very precarious situation. If you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about prayer and the, the word prayer comes uh, come from, the, from the Latin word precarious, which means desperate. He was in a, a place of desperation. So the family asked the church family to intercede for him, to petition God to have mercy and bring Antonio through this. Well, he did, and Antonio is off the ventilator and recovering and hopefully will be home in a, sh a few short days. So we praise God because he is the God of the open ear. He hears the cries of his people. 
Uh, because of uh, the disruption to our uh, normal way of doing things, we got away from our series on the Ten Commandments a few weeks ago. Uh, but we're going to finish the last two commandments this morning and next week. This morning is Deuteronomy 5.20. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And Ryan is going to read a complimentary text to that in uh, just a little bit. But for now, he's going to come up and read a call to worship. Well, hello again, church. It's good to be with you. Uh, even though we can't be together physically, it's good to know that you are worshiping together with us. And I pray that God would be glorified through our worship this morning at Foothills Together. And so for a call to worship, uh, I'll be reading from Psalm 138, Psalm of David. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple to give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the prideful he knows from afar. And though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purposes for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. You're rich. Yes, <laughs> 
forward so much to the day when we're all together again. We want, want to just bless you with our music as we bless the Lord to, today. Stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He Together we sing Every Lord, God Almighty. 
How lovely is your dwelling place Oh Lord Almighty Oh my soul longs and even thinks for you For oh, here my heart is sad Well, this is a point in our service where we typically will take our offering. We obviously can't do that. Um, we're grateful for all the faithful members of uh, the Foothills community here that have been giving online generously and sacrificially and sending in money to keep the, the, the ministry of the church going as we wait to be able to come back together. Uh, again, uh, let me just read something to you uh, from... This uh, devotional by Tim Keller, God's Wisdom for Navigating Life. 
One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. The more you scatter your wealth, the more you gather it. And the more you try to keep it for yourself, the more it dissipates. How can that be? Well, think of farmers. The more they scatter seed, the more they will reap. And keep in mind that seed comes back in a better form. As harvest, you can eat and sell. In the same way, spiritually wise people realize their money is seed, and the only way for them to turn it into real riches is by giving it away in remarkable proportions. Now, this is not a promise that the more you give away, the more money you're going to make. Rather, the more you give away wisely to ministries and people and programs that help people spiritually and physically, the more your money becomes the real wealth of changed lives in others and of spiritual health in yourself. And you will be walking in the footsteps of the one who was literally broken and scattered so he could gather us to himself. So Lord Jesus, your infinite loss on the cross has led to resurrection and infinite gains for us. So give me the faith to follow your path, to disperse and scatter my goods and my time for others, and thereby see your grace and life grow in the lives of people around me. Amen. Good counsel. So now, Father, as we... uh, delve into Deuteronomy, back again to the Ten Commandments. May your Holy Spirit bring clarity to the words of Moses. We put it to good use in our lives, in our community, in our world. In the name of Jesus, amen. Um, About a decade ago, the names of Brent uh, Siegelman and Colin Finnery were plastered all over the network news. These guys had been arrested, Uh, they had been indicted by a grand jury in connection with this lacrosse sex scandal down at the lacrosse team sex scandal at Duke University. They had had this drunken frat uh, frat party and they had brought in this exotic dancer to be part of the entertainment. So the beer was flowing and they were partying, everybody was debauched, drunk and so on and Anyway, uh, after the party, this woman claimed that she was sexually assaulted by these two men, Siegelman and Finnery. Um, They, on the other hand, said no, she was just being vindictive because of the monetary situation. She didn't get paid as much as she thought she should get paid or was agreed upon, and so she accused these guys of, of this crime. But anyway, they got arrested. And their lives were on the verge of utter ruination. If they were convicted, they'd go to prison. College was over. Life was over. But anyway, as the police further interrogated this young woman, she finally broke down and said, no, they really didn't do this. Uh, I was angry and I shouldn't have done it. But no, they didn't sexually assault me. I made it all up because I didn't get paid enough money. So they had been telling the truth. And she was guilty of violating the ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And who is my neighbor? My neighbor is anybody that I'm in community with, whether it be Foothills Fellowship or my next door neighbor, people I work with. Um, That story about the the, uh, Duke lacrosse sex scandal reaffirms the, the, the truth that words matter, truth matters. Um, Those two young men could have had their lives utterly destroyed because of a violation of the commandment we're looking at this morning. Back in World War II, uh, Japanese and German spies infiltrated the United States looking for information to help their side in the war. And so the government came out with an advertising campaign designed to remind American citizens to watch your speech, to be careful of information that you share in public. And the little slogan, we all know this, loose lips sink ships. Uh, Well, for our purposes, uh, 
I would say I need to watch my speech carefully because loose lips sink community. Uh, the politics of Washington are beyond my pay grade. It's zany. I can't try, try to follow what's going on, Democrat, Republican, and it's so convoluted, so complicated, so vulgar at times and vile that you just like, I have to step away from it and not even watch the news. And now with this new coronavirus and the impeachment of a few months ago, you have Democrats and Republicans going back and forth with all these accusations. Yeah, it was collusion with Russia. Oh no, he's in bed with China. Oh, wait a minute. Trump knew about the virus in, in, in January and he should have acted. Oh, wait a minute. All these governors uh, of various states could have ordered plenty of ventilators with plenty of time and they didn't do the right thing. And now this and that and the other thing. And I don't know. I don't know how you sort through all those accusations um, to find the truth. But what I do know is there seems to be a rampant uh, uh, violation of the words of Moses uh, going on in politics, uh, lies and innuendos and accusations and half-truths and so on. And what that does is that it destroys community, it destroys confidence in community because when we live in community, like for example here at Foothills Fellowship, we have to guard each other's well-being, each other's lives, and we guard each other through the way we use our speech. And we're careful not to bear witness in all of its forms, uh, false witness against one another, the people we live in community with. I ran into, a, I was talking to a friend of mine a number of years ago, and he brought up a person that left uh, the Foothills community under uh, some real negative circumstances. There was a lot of sinful ba behavior involved, and uh, the leadership confronted the situation and tried to bring redemption to it. It didn't work out. person left. And anyway, this person, once they left the community, uh, did a lot of slandering of the leadership of the church at the time, uh, trying to cast a, a, a bad light on the way leadership handled the situation. And uh, as someone who was on the inside of that, be part of that, I know that was what was being said was not true, was not how leadership handled things. And when we behave that way, when we uh, bear false witness against people we're in community with, it gives the evil one opportunity to stir up doubt and dissension and drawing up sides and cliques and divisions and suspicions and so on. We really need to be careful in community about the way we speak uh, to people and about people, that we guard the truth. And we, we're, we want to make sure we're aware of the forms that the violation of this commandment takes. So how about me? Um, do I bear false witness against my neighbors? Uh, am I careful with my speech? And if I do uh, sin with my speech, am I quick to confess it, even to go to people and say, I'm sorry for what I said, or I said something about you that I shouldn't. I've asked God to forgive me. You forgive me too. Do I understand how powerful my words are in preserving the life and the health and the vitality of God's community here at Foothills Fellowship? So as we do with the other commandments, let's take a look at the essence of what Moses is driving at, or God is driving at through Moses when he says this, and you, and that's singular in the Hebrew, because we, we live corporately as the church, but we each need to take individual responsibility for making sure we don't violate this commandment and bring division, disruption, dissension, and hurt within the church. So you, you, Ed, you are responsible, is what he's saying you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now remember, in the days of Moses, the testimony of a person was extremely important, more so than it is today, because back then you had no CSI Jerusalem. You didn't have uh, cameras everywhere recording what goes on in public. 
you didn't have uh, DNA blood sampling, things like that. When somebody was accused of a crime, they were utterly dependent on testimony. And if people bore false testimony, somebody was, could be sunk. There wasn't, you couldn't appeal to other sources for innocence. Everything was testimony. So let me take you back 3,500 years to the time of Moses. Moses is the judge of Israel. And this Hebrew gets dragged before Moses. He's hearing court cases. And this guy is accused of stealing pieces of gold from another Hebrew's tent. And this guy's an upstanding Hebrew. He has a wife, kids. He's never been accused of anything before. And yet, when he comes before Moses, people that know him violate this commandment through their silence. They bear false witness because they don't come forward and say, wait a minute, I know him. He's an honest man, a good man, a hard worker. I don't think he would have done this. Nobody does that. They're silent. They don't defend him. But another person uh, comes up and he brings uh, and he testifies and to some event that happened years ago that has nothing to do with this case and says, yeah, uh, I think he did something years ago and probably he did this now. And another person comes forward and says, uh, yeah, I know him and I I observe him to be lazy. He's just the kind of guy that would do these kind of things. Well, that's that's shaky testimony at best. And you had to have the testimony of two or three credible witnesses to be able to convict people in the court of Moses. And even in New Testament times where Paul, writing to Timothy, says, you know, if you're going to accuse an elder of unrepentant, sinful behavior, you better get a couple of witnesses to that behavior so there can't be any personal vendettas going on. And that was the way it was in the time of Moses. So this guy gets accused and all this shaky testimony comes forward and he could be in danger of losing his life. Testimony matters. Words matter. And the reason I, one of the reasons I think it's so easy to bear false witness against people is that we rarely ever know the whole story. It's easy to ob- observe the externals, make quick judgments about what the person is doing, what, what they're, what's going on, and we just judge them immediately. Like I was reading a, a story uh, this week by a, a woman named Carol Conger. She wrote into Reader's Digest, and she was talking about how a few summers ago, Her family had this barbecue, and the coals were winding down, and she decided they were going to roast marshmallows. So they got these long forks and marshmallows, and they were going to just start roasting them, and suddenly a couple of fire engines raced by their house and stopped at at a house across the street a couple of doors down. So her and her dinner guests, there were about 10 of them, they ran across the street, and this house was ablaze, and the people who owned the house were standing out on the sidewalk, and they were completely bummed out. I mean, their house is on fire. And then they turned and looked at Carol and all her dinner guests, and they were furious. And at first, she didn't make the connection. And she said, there they were. They were standing in front of this burning house with all these long forks and uh, marshmallows. Uh, It's, you know, the, the owners of the house looked at them and said, like, what kind of jerks are these people? But it was completely innocent. They didn't mean it. But that's how we bear false witness. We don't know the whole story. But sometimes we bear false witness out of vindictiveness. Somebody hurts us, and so we slander them or we tell untruths, or we are envious of somebody, jealous of a relationship. Um, We're just mean-spirited sometimes, and we don't realize the immense damage that can be done. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And what kind of consequences are there? Well, I'm from New Jersey, and a couple of towns over from where Jeannie and I met, um, there was a church that I was aware of that had a youth pastor that, similar to the Duke University scandal, got accused by one of the girls in the high school group of being inappropriate towards her. And he was a a good youth pastor. He had no blemishes on his record. He said, I didn't do that. That's not true. Well, anyway, they removed him, and they investigated the scenario, 
police got involved, and so on. And eventually, just like with the Duke University deal, the girl went to her parents and said, I feel really bad. He didn't really do anything. I was just angry at him because he didn't want to do something with the youth group that I wanted to do, and so I, I made up a story. And so the elder board had to bring him back in, and they said, well, she vindicated you, but so much damage had been done, so much doubt was placed in the, in the minds of people in the church, as particular parents in the youth group, that they let him go. They, they terminated him. And he was victimized by a violation of the ninth commandment. Words matter. Truth matters when you're in community. Uh, what forms does bearing false witness take? Well, there's outright lying. Hey, Carol, didn't you get my text? You're supposed to sit in nursery last week. I texted you, and you didn't show up, and we didn't have any coverage. Oh, no, I never got that text. Actually, you did, but you just didn't want to be bothered, so you just lied. You made up a story. How about exaggeration? You, we can bear false witness through exaggeration, and churches and crusades and so on, Christian organizations are notorious for inflating figures of attendance to make our ministry seem more vibrant, you know, more exciting. We're growing. We've got all these numbers, and we, we inflate those numbers sometimes. Uh, anytime you hear on the news uh, the Southern Baptist convention mentioned, they always say, and the Southern Baptist Convention is the biggest uh, evangelical denomination in America, 16 million uh, members. Well, a number of years ago, Frank Page, who was the then the, the president of the Southern Baptist Convention, said, no, we have to stop that. That's an exaggeration. He said the FBI couldn't track down 5 million uh, Southern Baptists, let alone 16 million Billy Graham, when he was alive, said, uh, we uh, as evangelicals love this game of inflating numbers so that we can boost our ministries. And we think it's harmless, but actually what it does is it casts suspicion and dispersion on what ordinarily would be legitimate, you know, vibrant ministries. We don't need to do that. And so when Billy Graham would, would do a crusade, they never counted the amount of people that showed up at a crusade. They listed the numbers based on the police records of how many people would show up in stadiums. And those police records typically were understated. But Billy Graham had incredible integrity uh, in his ministry, and so he would never inflate uh, numbers. We uh, violate this commandment through innuendo. Innuendo means that somebody is being discussed and I chime in, I pipe up, and I say a few words and I kind of let my words kind of tail off to give the impression that the person we're talking about mm, is maybe not so great. It's like uh, somebody says... Uh, well, how do you like serving with Harry on the elder board? And I say, well, I guess, I guess he's all right. And, uh, and I just leave it to people's imagination like, hmm, what did he mean by that? Is there something wrong with Harry? Is he a hard elder to work with? That's innuendo. And then there's flattery. We flatter people to typically manipulate them. We schmooze up to them because we want something out of them. Uh, Bob, you are some craftsman. You're wonderful. I've seen some of the furniture you've made in your house and the addition you put on your house. You are terrific. You remind me of the craftsmen in Second Kings that built the temple. You know, you're terrific. Oh, by the way, uh, I'm building a new deck on my house. Would you like to come? Could you come over and give me a hand? So you flatter him in the hopes of manipulating him into helping you. These are all forms of bearing false witness. Well, if it's a problem, and it certainly is, it's a problem in the church as well as outside of the church, how do I correct it? Well, I think a few things. One is 
the simple prayer of Francis of Assisi. Pray it in the morning as you start out. Lord, today, make me an instrument of your peace. Let me be an extension of your grace and your mercy. Mean it, and God will hear it. Watch the amount of words you use. The more words, the more sin. That's the way it is. Where There are many words. Proverbs 17 says, transgression is unavoidable. The more I talk, the more I end up sinning. Uh, Martin Luther said, many, many times I have regretted my speech. I have never regretted my silence. Consider the damage done. Do I really want to derail people's life and faith through bearing false witness? Am I too quick to gossip, to share information? Slander, remember, is a cowardly sin. It means I criticize a person who is not there to defend themselves. So I, re- I can remedy that, that by, by taking a position. If I have an issue with you, I, biblically, I go right to you and I talk to you about it instead of talking to everybody else about you. Handle things biblically. It's amazing when you do things biblically how well they work and when you don't how badly they turn out. Um, confess it. If I've got a sin of gossip, slander, negativism, critis- a critical spirit, I can say, God, help me with this. I don't want to be a burr in the saddle. I want to be an an encourager in the body. I want to bless people and not hurt them. When it comes to my words, I need to watch them because loose lips sink community. And we want our community here at Foothills to be spirit-filled and vibrant. And we want our church to be a safe place where people are loved, accepted, and forgiven. I'll finish by telling you, that Mark Twain was once on a fishing trip up in Maine, but it was past the time of fishing season, so he was fishing illegally. So he's up in Maine, and he hauls in this whole bunch of fish, and he's riding a train back to town, and he's sitting in a car with another guy, and it's only the two of them, and they're talking, and Mark Twain said, you should see, the, the guy said, what are you doing up here? And he said, oh, I was just fishing. I caught all these trout and blah, 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 and I got a whole bunch of them in the car back here on ice. And uh, Mark Twain said, well, who are you? What do you do? And the guy said, well, I'm a game warden. And uh, the game warden said, who are you? And Twain said, to be truthful, I'm the biggest liar in America. Um, Mark Twain could be really clever, and he can be really funny. But there's nothing clever and there's nothing funny about violating the Ninth Commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, the person you're in community with. So, Father, forgive me for the many, many times, I'm sure, over the decades that I have not been careful, not as careful as I should have been with my speech. And forgive us corporately for the times we have done damage Uh, to your heart and to one another here because we haven't been careful with our speech. Give us grace to speak well, to be encouragers, to speak words of truth that build people up. As Solomon said, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Give us grace here at Foothills to speak words of life in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, We had some special music over Easter weekend from Nate Cook and Josh Beckley, who have been part of Foothills, the Foothills family, for since they were little babies. Well, Rachel Alford, who was part of the praise team, who was raised here, Doug Alford's daughter, uh, is out in Costa Mesa, California. She's at the Calvary Chapel Worship Institute, learning to be to refine her musical skills and be a worship leader. Anyway, we, she sent us a, a video clip of her and some of her friends that she's uh, in a dorm with, like probably locked down with out there, and they did a little music video for us, so we're going to play that before the praise band does a couple of more songs to wrap up our service. Here we go.
Well, there's a lot that I don't know, but what I do know is that God does not want his children to live anxiously. Instead, he wants us to be like Joshua, and he told Joshua, be strong and courageous. As I was with Moses, I will be with you, and he will be with us. And this is what he says in Zephaniah chapter 3, The Lord your God is in your midst, and he is mighty to save. He will celebrate over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love, and he will rejoice over you with loud singing. You are his covenant people. Enjoy your Lord's day. Amen. Amen.